Father, you are the sovereign Lord, the King of all kings. We will. It's the intent of our heart, Father, to have nothing in front of you. We want you to rule. We want you to reign on the throne of our hearts. And we give you permission to do whatever you need to do, Father, to take control of that. We want to surrender to you, but we're not always so good at that. I got junk that gets in the way of me all the time, Father. We all do. So we're grateful for your grace. We're grateful for your mercy. And we plead for that, Father. And we ask that as you deal with us, do whatever you need to do. For us to be a people that have you at the front and center of everything about us. We're not here this morning, Father, to grade ourselves on what we do in worship or to grade ourselves on how we perform here, there, or whatever. Father, we're here to praise you and to know that you are master. You are Lord. You are King. You are everything. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said together. Amen. Amen, you guys. Have a seat. Look here now. Turn to Revelation 3. Meet with me over there. We're going to be spending a little time in Revelation chapter 3. We're going to kind of heat some things up. We've been talking about some stuff, actually a little summer series, where we've been talking about several things about our personal walk and uh, our focus on God. We want to tie some things, put a little heat on that. Actually, put a little heat on that. We live in Houston, right? We know about heat, don't we? Has it been hot the last several days, you guys? Man, it's been hot. And I don't know, what do you do to relieve yourself from the heat? Find the AC, man, I'm going to do that real quick. And I usually love to have something in my hand, cold to drink. My favorite go-to drink in the summertime is iced tea. I love iced tea. I love iced tea. Ice cold tea. I like enough ice in there where it's bumping into my nose. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you take a sip, you just get that chill all over. I'm an iced tea drinker from way back. My mother used to have, uh, this is way back in the 50s when we lived in Seguin, Texas. She had outside the back porch a little mint garden. Uh, there and she would go out and she'd pick some of that mint and crush it up, stick it in that tea. I'm not talking about tea you can see through. I'm talking about real pico dark ice cold tea. I love tea. Summertime, winter time, such as we have winter here. I love it. All the, well, actually, we don't have winter here, do we? We have summer, midsummer, late summer, and then we go back to summer again, right? Right. So tea is always, always good. I love iced tea, and I have in later years come to where I really like hot tea. Not as much as iced tea, but I really like hot tea. I'm not so much into the flavored stuff, but that dark, pico, piping hot tea, I love it. Hot tea, iced tea, <laughs> I love tea. Here's one thing I can't abide, room temp tea. I can't stand room temp tea. In fact, I don't know anything that I can really take at room temp. What about you guys? It just doesn't sound all that inviting. Another word for that is lukewarm, isn't it? I mean, what's good about that? I read the other day where President Obama had a lukewarm reception. Was that a compliment? I don't think that's good, right? Do you? I mean, it's better than cold, I guess, but maybe it's about the same thing. Lukewarm? Mm -mm. You ever been to a lukewarm ball game where the players are not really in it and maybe the fans are not really in it? It's just kind of, blah. That's lukewarm, right? You ever been in a lukewarm church? You ever been a part of a lukewarm worship assembly? What is that? Huh? I like it hot, don't you? Oddly enough, in our passage today, Jesus uses the word lukewarm to describe a church. And he's not being complimentary about that at all. Lukewarm is a word that refers not moving from cold to hot, but it's a word that refers where you're going from hot down to cold. If you move from cold to hot, you say that's warming up. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But from hot to cold, it, you go through that lukewarm state. You knew it. You had it. You felt it. You were there. You were all over it. And then somewhere along the way, it just kind of started to cool down. Lukewarm. And he's not very happy in Revelation chapter 3 about that stuff, right? He describes it as being neither hot nor cold. That's his description. We're going to read it word for word here in just a second. But that's how he describes it. Neither hot nor cold. And how does he feel about it? Jesus, how do you feel about that? He says, let me tell you what. It makes me want to spit you out of my mouth. Here's how he feels about it. That's kind of gross, isn't it? I can't believe I just did that in front of you guys, my friends. But that's what he says, isn't it? That's what it is, isn't it? Lukewarm. Let's kind of put a few more words around that besides just neither hot nor cold so we know what we're talking about. How do you describe, what is lukewarmness? Is it, a, is it a virtue? I mean, sometimes it's kind of handy, isn't it? 
You can know some stuff but not really have to respond to it, right, if you're lukewarm. It's a, you know what it is? It's a temptation. It's, it's tempting to be indifferent. Because what we're called to do and what we're called to be is a, pretty, is a pretty radical bunch of folks, isn't it? I mean, when you get down to it. We're not here just to be saved. We're here because we got a challenge from God Himself to, to do something in the lives of people. Really, it's all, about, it's all about people, isn't it? People in here and people out there. And if you're indifferent or, or lukewarm, you can kind of categorize people. You can call them, you can call them the poor. And not really get involved in it, right? Or you can call them the lost and or the worldly, or you don't really have to get involved. See, lukewarm is a temptation. In fact, it's a seduction because people get in the way of stuff. They get in the way of our dreams. They get in the way of our plans. They get in the way of our our, our vacation time. They get in the way of just about everything that you can imagine. And if you're lukewarm, you can kind of say, yeah, I know that, I know that, and someday, you know, but really, honestly, you don't really get around to doing it. You can look at people and categorize them, objectivize them. Is that a word? You don't know what I'm talking about, though, right? If it's a word or not, don't you know? And, and it's not very personal. It's not very involved. It's not very vital. It's not very passionate. It's it's lukewarm. In fact, let me tell you what else. Lukewarm is dangerous. It's more dangerous than anger or hatred. Anger, at least when you get angry sometimes, it moves you to do something about the injustice. Do you know what I'm saying? You get angry enough with it and you're going to do something about it, right? Or hatred. You've got to respond to the hatred if you feel that. You've got to reach out somehow and control that or, 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 or deal with it in some kind of way. But indifference, lukewarmness, that's, it's no response at all. It's no response. It's no beginning and it's no response. It's just bleh. Let's let, let's, let, let's let Jesus get down to some business here. I'm in Revelation 3, verse 14. Here's what he says. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. Uh, okay. Here's what's going on in Revelation 2 and 3. There's seven churches over in Asia, ancient churches, that he's writing letters to. He says something different to each one of them, right? We're going to look at a couple of them. We're going to look at the church in Philadelphia next week, all right? But right now, we're looking at the church in Laodicea. It's the last one that he writes. And the one he's telling to write, we know who that is. If you've read the book of Revelation, right? He identifies himself in chapter 1. It's John the Apostle. He's been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And it's a Sunday one day. And the Spirit of God visits him and inspires him to send messages to these seven churches, all right? To the angel of the church. And I see a lot of folks get all, right, what does that mean by the angel? Is there an angel? Every church have an angel? Is that the idea? Or maybe it's the head elder, right, that he's talking about. Look, look, you need to know something about the book of Revelation. There's a drama unfolding in the book of Revelation. And everything in Revelation has an angel. Rivers have angels. Bowls have angels. Trumpets have angels. Wind has an angel. It comes, it's personified. There's, there's a drama unfolding. There's a story unfolding in the book of Revelation. So when he writes to the church of the, or to the angel of the church in Laodicea, he's writing to the church. Right? He's writing to the whole church. And by the way, I want you to know something. He's not just writing to Laodicea. Because look down at verse 22 just for a second. After he says all he's going to say, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, it's a message to all the churches. Not just those seven, but all the churches. There's a hermeneutical hook right there. There's something applicable to everybody. There's something to learn for everybody and every church. He's got something to say to all of us, this inspired word. All right. So here we go. Still in verse 14. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of of God's creation. Who is that? Oh, oh, let's say it all together. That is, that's Jesus, right? You knew that already if you had a red letter edition. Because the words of Jesus are in red. Right? Now, he identifies himself in a particular way here. He identifies himself differently in each of those seven letters. It kind of depends on what's going on in that church. Here he says, I am the amen to this church that's lukewarm. This church that has had something at one time and now they've lost it. He says, I'm the amen. I am the so be it. I am the peg in the ground. I am where you stand. Here it is. I am the faithful and true witness. I'm the one that came into the world to show and to proclaim the glory and the majesty and the beauty and the dignity of God Almighty. 
And I was so faithful and true to that witness that I died. I went to the cross for it. Nothing about lukewarmness in me. Nothing about indifference in me. No, sir. I am the amen. I am the faithful and true witness. I am the ruler of God's creation. Who do you go to that's higher than that? Here's the answer. Nobody. When he speaks, every ear listens. Whether we're in Laodicea or we're in Sugar Grove. Right? Because he's the amen. He's the faithful and true witness. He is the ruler of God's creation. What's the problem here? Verse 15. I know your deeds. You're neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Did he really mean that? Would he really rather have them cold than lukewarm? Maybe he's just saying that to kind of demonstrate the horror of being indifferent, the horror of lukewarmness, the horror of seeing what's out there to do and what's out there to be and just not doing it, just not being it. I wish you were one or the other, he says. So because you're lukewarm, verse 16, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What's going on here? You know what these guys are? You know what the church in Laodicea was like? It's like a bunch of geese coming to church on Sunday and passionately talking about flying and then walking home. Did you get my imagery there? Passionately talking about it, but then walking home. There's an old story by Soren Kierkegaard. If any of you guys are into theology, you may have heard this story before. He tells a story about a goose that's flying with a bunch of other geese south for the winter, like they always do, right? They're flying south, and this goose is so tired He's tired of flying and he's hungry. He's worn out. He's in formation. They're honking as they go through the sky. Isn't that a beautiful sound? You ever hear, hear geese flying south? What a beautiful sound that is. It just kind of does something to you. It really does. So they're flying south and he happens to look down. He's like, what in the world? He looks down and he's flying over a barnyard. And there's a farmer out there throwing corn out. And there's ducks eating the corn. There's geese. There's chickens. There's pigs. Everybody's eating this corn. This farmer's just giving it to them. And he says, I can, look at that. And they're just all out there eating together. And he says, man, I could, is that, is that really, is that, is that real? He drops out of formation. He circles around. And he lands behind a stump, a log, props his head up over there. And he looks, he takes it in. Is there any danger here? Is this really what I'm saying? And there was that farmer throwing out corn. The pigs were eating it. The geese were eating it. The ducks and the chickens. And so he decides to do a little test and he jumps out from behind the log and he runs into the barnyard and picks up a kernel of corn and he runs back, pops his head up. Nothing chased him. Nothing chased him. He couldn't believe. He does it again. Runs a second test. Does it again. Runs a third test. And finally he just kind of gets up there and he just eats a little bit. And he says, this, whoa, sweet. And there's a shed there that he can go and stay in at night. Even though it gets cold, he can be protected. There's a pond for him to swim in. And the farmer came out every single day. And he thought, I'm going to stay here for a few days and just kind of get my strength back, get, get, get caught up. So he stayed a few days. It was great. He wound up staying a few more days. And the next thing you know, the time for flying south for winter was past. And he wound up staying there an entire year. A year has gone by. Geese are once again flying south for the winter. And he's down there in the barnyard and he's eating that corn. And he hears high overhead those geese honking. And he throws his head up. A kernel of corn falls down out of his beak. Something primal strikes him on the inside. Something deep down. Something that speaks to what he was built for and what he's all about. Begin to flap those wings. He's going to go. He's going to go. And he flaps as hard as he can. And he gets about up to the eaves of the barn. Before his fat butt crashes back down to the ground. He's too fat. And he hadn't exercised those things in a year. But he's still hearing it. And he flaps them again. And he gets up to the eave of the barn. And down he crashes. He does that about three times. And he says, what's the point? What's the point? He said, I need to spend a year and get in shape. I'm going to spend a year here and I'm going to get in shape and next year. So he spends a year and the next year rolls around to fly south for the winter. He hears them go by, but you know what? He hadn't done a thing about it. So he says next year. Next year rolls by and then the next year and finally gets to where he doesn't even hear them anymore. From passion to lukewarm to cold. That's what's going on in Laodicea. They're right there in the process. They had it, they tasted it, they felt it, they knew it. And something had come up, something had happened 
within that church. Made Jesus sick to his stomach, right? What had happened? What was going on here? Well, that's verse 17. Jesus speaking directly to them. He says, you say, he's talking to what the church in Laodicea says. You say, well, I'm rich. I have acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. Imagine that. I don't need anything. But you don't realize that you're really blind. You don't really see anything. You don't realize that you're poor, wretched, uh, excuse me, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Laodicea. This was a wealthy, wealthy church. All right? Wealthy city. Per capita, you can't imagine how wealthy these guys were. Laodicea was built on the uh, crossroads of three major Roman roads. Everybody, all the trade went through Laodicea. And there was a huge banking industry going on in Laodicea. They were making money hands over fist. I mean, it was a rich place to be. And not only that, but they produced a product called shiny black wool. Everybody wanted this stuff. They could not package it up and send it out fast enough. Everybody wanted it. Armani wanted it. Christian Dior wanted it. Ralph Lauren wanted it. Everybody wanted it. And the money just comes pouring in. And not only that, there was a medical center there inside the loop. <laughs> a medical center. And they specialized in ISAV that came out of the springs that were there in Laodicea. By the way, the springs were known for their lukewarm water. Amazing how Jesus fits that imagery, isn't it? And they made ISAV. It was sought after all the world. I mean, they were so well. There was an earthquake there in 60 A.D., and uh, all these cities were making an appeal to the Roman government for assistance to help them rebuild. Laodicea, Laodicea said, nope, don't need it. Imagine that. Don't need it. We got this. We are wealthy. We don't need a thing. And what had happened somewhere in there, it clouded their vision and they could not see how God saw them. They couldn't see what was really there, what was really there to, to see. What was the problem? Now, don't say money. Don't say wealth. That wasn't the problem. That's like saying spoons cause obesity. Really. If you want to lose weight, just get rid of all your spoons, right? It'd take care of it, wouldn't it? No, it's not money. But it's what happens sometimes with money. We get so doggone comfortable you know, we got that income. We got, it's all, you know, and we have our plans and we get comfort. Now, I'm going to say a couple of things that are kind of tough, okay? Uh, and, and listen, there's a guy named Tim Bascom who's wrote a book called The Comfort Trap. And he makes a statement in there. He says, he's talking about American churches. He says, we are too comfortable to be spiritual. What well, kind of, when I first read that, I thought, oh, come on now, Tim. I mean, that's a bit strong. Maybe you're just trying to make a point, be, say something, and, be, and make a point. But you get to think, you know what I got to realize? You know what I, I have is kind of at the back of my mind? That I can grow better spiritually if all the danger and all the trouble is gone. I'm not looking for a show of hands, but I'm wondering how many people think it's better. Spiritual growth is better if all the trouble and all the danger is gone. But really, the testimony of history is it's just the opposite of that most vibrant growth that we've ever known in the history of the church in the first 400 years when it was tough. Tough. Could that be right? You know what? I think the hardest thing in the world is to grow spiritually when you're comfortable. I don't think there's anything tougher than that. I'm not, in, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic here, but I think when we get comfortable, it gets really, really tough. And you just kind of lose your grip. You ever heard of Steve Irwin? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Nobody's seen him since September the 4th, 2006. When he was killed, Steve Irwin, what's his moniker? What's he also known as? Crocodile Hunter. Yeah. 14 years, he had a series documentary about him and wildlife. And he was known for his antics and how he could get out there. Just really kind of wild stuff. Did you know, do you know how many times he was bitten by a snake? I don't either. The closest number I can come to, according to some people, is countless. Count, now, he probably knew exactly how many times. But they said countless times. He was spit in the face by a red spitting cobra. He was run up a tree by a poisonous Komodo dragon. He was drugged into the water by a crocodile. 
This guy is insane. I mean, if he knew animals, nobody knew animals like he did. He died on September the 4th, 20, 2006. You can still see the video of it on YouTube before the photographer realized what had happened. He was killed by what they call the pussycat of the seas. Stingray. They call it a pussycat because it's never attacked anybody. It's the most docile creature that you can imagine. That's why cruise liners or tourist boats will pull over and let everybody get out and play with the stingrays. How many people have ever done that? Anybody in here ever done that? I've done that too. You know what Steve did? He was just too comfortable, I think. I'm not trying to pass judgment here. But I think he got too comfortable. And that five-foot stingray did a defensive mood move and shot a 10-inch serrated barb through his sternum and into his heart. You can see it on film. And his words were, he knew it immediately, I'm dying, I'm dying. Got him up out of water. He tried to pull it out. He couldn't get it out. What happened there? What is the experience that killed him? It wasn't all that. He got too comfortable, I think. Too comfortable. He didn't realize. He just didn't. He just, he just wasn't seeing what he was dealing with. Now, look. What do you do? What do you do? We're here to, we're here to be Jesus to people, right? And uh, sometimes we can get kind of caught up in all of our stuff. What do you do? Well, here's his words. Here's what Jesus says. He says, look. I'm down in verse 18. He says, here's my advice to you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. White clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Your banking center, you got that black shiny wool, you got eye salve. Let me tell you what, you need to get the real thing. Buy gold from me. What does he mean by that? He just means get connected to me, right? It's gold refined by fire. It's the genuine stuff. Get those white garments on. Get, yes, listen, listen. Here it is. Look at the latter part of verse 19. Two sentences in verse 19. Here's the second one. Be earnest and repent. You know what earnest means? Fire up. Fire up. Lukewarm? Fire up. Repent. Change it. You can ch- And be Jesus to people. Connect to me. Connect to me. Fire up and and repent. Now, how do you do that? Now, listen, I want to caution us about a little something here. Sometimes we think, well, I need to study the Bible more. We we all do. You remember earlier this summer we were talking about you've got to have that foundation, that devotional foundation to God or you're not going anywhere, right? Y'all remember that? That was back in June, part of our series. You've got to do that. So, But I want to tell you, the truth of God's Word, if it's really going to free your life, it has to be existential. You have to live it. Because if you just look at it and know it, I mean, that's, but it doesn't go anywhere. And it becomes orthodoxy. And orthodoxy can get really, really cold. It's like words without music. It's like a dance without a song. There's no fire. There's no glow. There's no hallelujah in that. Just because you know it. Listen, one life that has been genuinely Touched by the experience of Jesus is worth more than a whole library of arguments. That's the honest truth. So, so, so it's not just a matter of looking more deeply into the Word. That's important. Don't think that it's not. But it's more than that. You know what? You, got to, you, 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 you have to make up your mind that here's what I'm going to do. I am going to be Jesus to people. I am going to live it. And then you intentionally go about the business. It's not going to happen by itself. You just be that goose that talks passionately about flying and then walk home. you got to do it. Listen, there's a guy that I know. Let me just tell you a story, and I need to get done with this. But his name is Matthew Woodley. Uh, he's a preaching colleague of mine. We didn't go to school together, but, but I know him. And, and, and you know what? I want to tell you just, just, so that, just to kind of give you a context for it. Preaching, ministry is hard on people. Full-time ministry is hard on people. Burnout rate is huge. Right? It's huge. And Matthew had been in full-time ministry for about eight years. And he said, I can't take it anymore. He got fed up with it. He started feeling icy and cold, and people didn't really, ma- I mean, it was like he said, I, who, I didn't, he didn't really care about people. He said, they don't want to change anyway. They just listen, and they whatever, and it just doesn't. And he said, I just finally got to the point where it just wasn't working for him anymore. It just got, and he realized, he'd had a call to ministry, but after eight years, it was just 
So here's what happened. He got a second call to ministry. And it happened at a family vacation to Libby, Montana. Okay? He goes to Libby, Montana, and his wife and kids said, You go somewhere, man. Get off by yourself. We can't hardly stand you right now. So he goes off to the city park. He's got his Bible with him, and he's in prayer. He's praying. He's looking at the Word. He's trying to figure out, what do you want me to do here? Because I'm sick of this. I'm tired of it. And he looks up, and three little kids are walking toward him. I may have mentioned this story. I, I, I've told this to several people because it's meaningful to me. If I have, forgive me of that. I, I, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't have a record that I did, but let me just tell you about it. Three little kids are walking up to him, and it's clear that they're homeless. I mean, the clothes are dirty. They're dirty. You could smell them before you could see them, just about. They're walking up with a little sack lunch in their hand. And before he could move away, because he's really empty, before he could move away, they plopped themselves down right there. And the oldest one was a little girl. She started talking, kind of the spokesman of the group. She said, hi, my name's Dina. I'm 12. This is my sister, Christy. She's 10. That's my little brother, Mikey. Doesn't he look cute? He's so fat in that little Lion King shirt. He's six. They sit down. And he doesn't, you know, he's not, he doesn't really want to, it's just, but Dina keeps on talking and she unfolds this story of this dysfunctional family. She said, they aren't, that is my sister and my brother, but she said, really, my dad is dead and Christy's dad disappeared. We don't know where he is. And Mikey's dad beats him up. And so my mother's going to divorce him because he's a creep. And right now my mother is with her fiance, Larry. They're at the casino. They need some alone time. So they went to the gas station and bought us these barbecue burritos, told us to stay in the park for two hours. Can we sit? Can we sit with you? So he says, sure. What's he going to say? So just to be polite, he says, well, you guys live in town? And Dina, who's the spokesman, she says, no, we used to. My mom lost her job. She paused a minute. And she says, I hate living in a tent. That explained a lot right there, right? A little more silence, and she says, Say, what do you do for a job? It's kind of like, here you are in the middle of the day sitting out here in the park. I mean, what, what do you do for a job? He said, well, he said, I'm a preacher. Big, long silence. Crickets. She says, could you tell me something? She said, I've heard stories about Jesus walking around and talking to people and healing people and feeding people and loving people. I'm quoting here. She says, why didn't he do that anymore? It's right there in Matt's face. See? So he launches off. He's still kind of cold. He launches off into this story of the, the incarnation of Jesus and starts to talk about you know this stuff orthodoxically correct <laughs> but he starts telling them about that and he looks down at them and there they are just kind of staring at him there's Dina and Christy with their limp burritos and Mikey with barbecue sauce spread across his Lion King shirt those love hungry eyes and he starts to weep and he says Dina, Christy, Mikey let me start over do you have any idea how much Jesus loves you right now. And it totally altered their vacation plan. But there it was to be Jesus to people. And he says, I want to tell you, it was my second call to ministry. Listen, there's no substitute for just doing it. Amen. Just doing it. Sharing that gospel story when the opportunity arises. Getting with people. It's not just poverty. There's individuals in there. It's not just, there's people. And we are here to be one-on-one. -on -one. Didn't he send us into this world the way he sent his own son into the world? Into the dust and the heat of it? To look people eyeball to eyeball? Just be, just be there. Now there's five take-homes. Here we go. I'm going to do them quick. Here's number one. It's a question. These are coming out of this passage as well as verses 19, 20, and 21, okay? Here's five take-homes. Number one is a question. I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to do it every day for a little while. Will you do that? Here it is. If today was the last day that I had to live, would I still do today what I'm planning to do? Now, you may feel like I'm trying to manipulate you a little bit. I, I, I don't mean to. It's a question about priorities, isn't it? And we've all got stuff that we have to do that we don't want to do, right? I mean, it's just stuff that you've got to do because you've got life going on, right? But it's really a question about priority. What's really important? 
So I put it, phrased it this way, because the first way is kind of lukewarm. That other way is kind of lukewarm. What's the big priority of life? You kinda, you get, so here it is. If today was the last day that I had to live, would I still do today what I'm planning on doing today? Ask yourself that tomorrow. And if you go too many days in a row where the answer is no, because you're not getting down to what you really think is important, then you need to make a shift. Somebody once said, if you live every day as if it's your last day, one day you'll be right. <laughs> okay, that's the question. Number two, take a look at this. I don't want to say anything, just look at it. It's a challenge. Intercept. Stop lukewarmness. Indifference. When you see it croaching in, you've got you to step up. A word that I like to use sometimes, I think I've used it before, is entropy. Entropy is a word that comes from the second law of thermodynamics. It has to do with the availability of energy. It's something that speaks to the fact that the universe is winding down, if you're into any of that kind of stuff at all. It's, what, it's what's talking about if you leave something alone, it deteriorates. Like a house that's empty, after a while, what happens to it? And it's, yeah. Yeah, anything else, it just deteriorates. Entropy, entropy. Entropy is not just the enemy of the universe, you guys. It is the enemy of the human spirit. It creeps in, and all of a sudden, hopes kind of begin to fall by the wayside, dreams begin to die, and you begin to realize that you can live with mediocrity. Mm. Stop it. Don't let it happen. Look at Proverbs chapter 27 just for a second, verses 23 and 24. It looks like he's talking about taking care of sheep and taking care of being a king, but it's not. This passage is about entropy. It's about lukewarmness. It's about stopping it. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. What's he saying? Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, because what you're not paying attention to is winding down. Lukewarmness is there. Accept the challenge. Here's number three. Look at this. Just let it, I don't know, just want you to read it first of all. Here it is. There's a guarantee. That's verse 19. He says, the people I love, I'm going to rebuke and discipline. How exciting does that sound? If I love you, I'm going to mess with you. When he messes with you, don't run away from that. Don't run away from that. Open up your eyes and see the finger of God in your life. Don't run for cover. Cover is dangerous ground. Because that's a promise. Embrace it. Embrace that promise. Now, look. Look at number four. Just sort of look at it. Here's the promise. That was the guarantee. Here's the promise. Verses 20 and 21. Let God's grace flow. Here it is. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And not only that, to him who overcomes, I'll give him the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Talk about an invitation. Come have dinner with me. Come have dinner with me. Because I promise no matter where you are right now, you fire up, you be earnest. Turn it around and here it is. In fact, we're going to have dinner with him right now. I'm going to ask the folks that are serving us the Lord's Supper if you guys would gather around the table. Invitation from the king to be what he called us to be. Let's have dinner with him. Doc, take home number five. It's a prayer. It's a prayer for God to mess with us. I want you to look into your life, and I'm going to look into my life. We all look into our lives as a congregation and on a personal level. God, we want you to mess with us. Make it, give, us, give, us, give us those difficulties. Give us those things. You promise, if you love us, he's going to rebuke and he's going to discipline. Let's ask him. Let's ask him to give us those times that we awaken, that we do. So I'm going to ask us to do that right now uh, together as we are. Just kind of move where you can. Let's join hands together. And let's pray for that disruption. Father, you have blessed us so richly in this place. Um, so, so much that we have to be thankful for. It's such a great country to be a part of. 
Father, we look at all of those blessings and we realize that those are not the things that, are, that mess with us, but it's what we start to think as a result of it. So I'm asking, Father, for you to uh, mess with us. Do what you need to do. If we feel, Father, that we are trusting too much in our stuff, then you rustle us up with that. And I realize I may not know exactly what I'm praying for, but, Father, we want to give you permission to do what you want to do because you love us. If we're thinking, Father, that it's, it's, it's easier maybe than it ought to be, maybe, maybe we haven't dreamed big enough. And if, it's, if we're feeling safe, maybe we have not gone far enough away from the shore. So I ask, Father, that you would mess with us. That we would get far enough from the shore, Father, where we can't see land. That we would, in our personal lives and as a congregation, that we would get far enough from the shore... That we would see the storms and would be a part of those, and we would witness your mastery over all of that. Father, this isn't just words. We want to be offering up to you a prayer from our heart and our soul. Do it. We give you that permission. This we say to you in Jesus' name. And the church said, Listen, I want to close with this one thought. It's an observation by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. If it's true, it's of ultimate importance. One thing it cannot be is moderately important. Let's praise God together. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses' righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sore, and we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, rising on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, to hear up to believe. Becoming as flesh, and these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide in your world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of science till salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 No, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Jubilee.